everyone. I would like to warmly welcome you all on behalf of the entire IntelliCap and the Sankal team. Today, we will be talking about designing resilience health systems across LMICs, and we have the honor of having some of the best minds in the field of global health, and that they go into designing a resilient health system. In many ways, the challenge of building strong health systems has always been a matter of much debate and discussion in the realm of global health. However, the COVID-19 pandemic was a wake-up call for all health systems, and the topic is now in the spotlight much more than ever. We're going to delve into some of the key elements that need to be considered to make resident health systems a reality. While many countries are rightly focusing on developing strong health systems at all levels, our focus today is going beyond these basics of beds, buildings, and hospitals, and thinking about health systems in a much more holistic manner. We will be listening to our thought leaders about reinvigorating these health systems and making more accessible, affordable, and more attuned to the new normal. In the past few years, some major tectonic shifts have occurred in the practice of healthcare. Primarily, there has been a rising awareness among policymakers regarding the need to integrate public and private healthcare systems and use both of, both of their capabilities to the best. Second, many LMICs have been exploring investments in technologies which are future-proof and trying to leapfrog the existing healthcare practices that are ongoing in the world. And finally, there has been a major thrust from various stakeholders from making healthcare more accessible and approachable based on socio-cultural context rather than simply applying foreign solutions to local problems. Based on that, our speakers today bring together a phenomenal and eclectic mix of experiences from various domains within healthcare. And I'm sure that all of you are really eager to hear more from them now. So without any further ado, I would like to introduce our esteemed panel to all of you today. First of all, we have our moderator for today, Mr. Anand Sinha. Anand is a very well-known leader and speaker in the development sector across India. He has led organizations such as Apt Associates, and he is currently the country advisor for the David and Lucy Packard Foundation in India. He has previously been at critical roles at the Gates Foundation, Deloitte, and IMRP. Anand brings a wealth of experience in designing and implementing private sector engagement strategies in health, specifically in the domains of sexual and reproductive health. Next, we have Ms. Radharani Mitra, who is the Global Creative Advisor for BBC Media Action. Radharani has more than two decades of experience in the field of communication and human-centered design. She specializes in design thinking-based interventions for improving health programs and enhancing the efficacy of frontline workers through the use of new and legacy media-based interventions. Her work has won several awards in India and abroad, including one at Cannes. We are also glad to have Ms. Bianca Dreber, who hails from the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria on our panel today. Bianca brings with her the experience of leading and conceptualizing private sector engagements with a wide sort of variety of partners. Some of these partners include pharmaceutical companies, biotechnology companies, consumer giants as well, and she has really helped design uh, programs and strategies leveraging on the specific strengths of these companies for tackling the key problems of TB, AIDS, and malaria, and some other allied challenges, such as maternal and child health. Next, we have Mr. Steve Davis. Steve is currently the co-chair of the WHO Digital Health Technical Advisory Group, and he's also the interim director for BMGF in China. Steve formerly led PATH as its president and CEO. PATH is the program for appropriate technologies in health, which is a leading global health innovation organization, and he was also the director for social innovation and McKinsey. He has, written, he has written prolifically about the intersection of innovation, technology, and social impact, and has recently written a book titled Undercurrents. Finally, we will have a recorded keynote address from Ms. Arti Ahuja, since she could not be here today due to some urgent commitments. Ms. Arti Ahuja is the, is the additional secretary of health at the Minister of Health and Family Welfare at the Government of India. She is credited with leading some great government programs in some of the most underserved areas of India, and she is the recipient of the McNamara Fellowship at Princeton and the Presidential Fellowship at Harvard during her stints of education there. Before we begin the session, I would like to share some very important housekeeping rules. Kindly keep yourselves on mute during the session and type any questions or comments that you have for our panelists in the chat box. Our team will be monitoring those, and after the moderated discussion, we will be sending a list of curated questions to the moderator to post them to the panelists. Finally, I would like to thank, extend a heartfelt thanks to all the panelists, some of whom I know are joining from very different time zones, and it's really odd time for them. And I would now like to hand over to Anand to, hand to, to take over the discussion. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sagar. And um, thank you for setting this up so nicely. So um, 
Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, um, everyone, and a uh, special warm welcome to my panelists who are joining from a number of different time zones um, across the globe. So when IntelliCAP, uh, the team asked me to moderate this, I happily said yes, both because I, I'm, I've been following and I've been very impressed with the SunCup platform for many years, but looking at the lineup of panelists, I realized it was the easiest job in the world. Um, to have a group of people like this speaking about how to build um, a health system uh, or, or sort of think about how to reconstruct a health system post-COVID. It's something that's obviously on, on our minds and is very central to, you know, um, what we, we are um, thinking. I think, um, you know, and the panel of speakers today covers it from pretty much all the important perspectives. You know, we have, we have you know, government, what is the public sector and what is the government doing? We have, you know, speaker um, Bianca will be talking about the private sector perspective. There's huge doors and opportunities that have been opened with respect to technology and digital platforms. And one of the core issues that we're all dealing with, I think, in this pandemic and realizing more and more is sort of the issues of behavioral aspects. How do you sort of, you know, bring about trust and um, behavior change um, for health? So these are the topics that we will be talking about. I did want to open with a video and primarily just a couple of comments about the fact that, you know, the opportunity here is to think about what we want to do and build back better, right? We, we recognize that COVID is and we're not through it yet, but COVID continues to be a terrible, um, uh, you know, scourge, and 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 it is it is forcing us to think and rethink and do things that we would never have done before. But it is also opening opportunities for us to think about a new sort of you know health system. And and the title of this you know panel is really about building uh, you know beyond the beds and the buildings part of this. How do you really think about? Um, the aspects of, of care, the aspects of building systems that will um, try and think about those who are left behind. I think issues about equity and uh, inclusiveness are going to be critical as we think about how strong our health systems are again. Um, I'm not going to speak too much about this because I think our speakers are going to talk to this. I would love to just line up that first video. Um, this, is a, this is based on um, an article that Arundhati Roy had written um, called the, the Pandemic is a Portal. Um, maybe let's just watch that and then we'll move into the panel. Whatever it is, coronavirus has made the mighty kneel and brought the world to a halt like nothing else could. Our minds are still racing back and forth, longing for a return to normality. Trying to stitch our future to our past and refusing to acknowledge the rupture. But the rupture exists. And in the midst of this terrible despair, it offers us a chance to rethink the doomsday machine we have built for ourselves. Nothing could be worse than a return to normality. Historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly, with little luggage, ready to imagine another world. ready to fight for it. Thank you. Um, every time I do watch a video, I, I, I feel that it just helps us sort of think about what we're going through fairly well. It's, it's, we're going through a very dark and difficult time, but it is a opportunity for us to think about the future. 
Um, I'm going to move into the panel. We, we, we were very fortunate to have um, Arti Ahuja to agree to join this panel, but at the last minute, she had to be pulled away, as is uh, often happens with uh, senior government personnel. But she was kind enough to record a message for her, and I'm looking forward to hearing what she has to say about the role of the government, the perspective on COVID, but also thinking about what the future might hold. Could we have uh, Arti's message, please? Thank you so much for inviting me for this workshop. I'm really very sorry I'm not able to attend in, uh, in person. I mean, virtually being there and it's being recorded. I would have really loved to be there and listen to the eminent panel of experts and people who are participating in this. It's my loss entirely, but I will definitely catch up and take uh, account of all the inputs that have been given. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic, which is the issue for discussion today, the pandemic has taught us a, a lot, all of us, all over the world. And it's not over yet. It is still there. It is still, uh, the virus is mutating, even though vaccines have come. We do not know what lies ahead. But having said that, whatever we have undergone as a country, as a society, at an individual level, and also at the government level, is something that we must take note of, we must learn from, we must internalize, and we must act upon. What has the COVID-19 pandemic taught us? The primary thing it has taught us is that a pandemic of this nature needs a whole of government and a whole of society approach. It's not just about health. It is about all parts of government. And it is not just about government, it is about the whole society. It is the individual themselves, and it is the private sector, the academia, the experts, the scientists, the manufacturers. From a stage where we had just one testing laboratory, today we have 2,500 plus laboratories for RT-PCR testing. It's not a small thing. And how has this come about? It's the private sector that is coming. We did not manufacture PPEs, and today we are exporting them. So it's a coming together of a whole lot of people, and that is the primary lesson that COVID has taught us. Another thing it has taught us is that we need to rely on evidence. Any decision that is made has to be evidence-based. The science behind COVID management has been changing. We all know that. It has been very dynamic in nature. However, there have to be very clear SOPs and so that a clear direction is given. And the ministry, the health ministry, has been you know, issuing very clear clinical protocols, very clear standard operating procedures for various things and also a lot of online training for health workers, a lot of online uh, training and modules for people at large, including issues of mental health due to being, uh, you know, many issues uh, that came up. So a lot of this has gone on. That kind, So what it also teaches us is that we need to look at evidence and we need to respond in a systems design way. We need to respond not or even though the evidence is dynamic in nature, our response has to be standardized. So these are the two things we have learned. Now, what is it that we need to do going ahead? The first and primary thing is we need to be prepared to respond, not just to COVID, definitely COVID, but to also other pandemics which may be coming. And what do we need to do? We need to realize that there are there have been chronic shortages. For example, ICU beds, ventilators. The ventilators were earlier all imported into India, and today we are manufacturing our own ventilators. So we need to augment the capacity of our healthcare delivery system in the private sector and in the government sector, making it ready. What do we mean by readiness? One part of it is the infrastructural readiness for which we have the emergency COVID response package 
the first one was about 15,000 crores and the second one is more than 20, 23,000 crores. That is just one part of it. It provides for greater surveillance, greater uh, genome sequencing ability, greater uh, bed capacity, bed capacity for pediatric beds, greater oxygen uh, availability, greater drug availability. So that is a substantial part of how the, uh, the capability of the public health delivery system in the country is being looked at. The other important part is the people, the people who will manage these facilities. They also need uh, inputs. They also need their own resource augmentation. So you all know that there was uh, uh, an insurance scheme, especially for health workers. Apart from that, a whole lot of, I think nearly uh, three or four lakh health workers across the country or maybe even more have been trained on this then there are the telemedicine services which are also part of the ecrp but even otherwise e sanjeevni uh, has you know we are now wanting more than five lakh consultations every day and already we have had a lot of consultations through e sanjeevni which also brings me to the whole ayushman uh, which uh, to the national digital health mission which is what is ndhm underwent a pilot through the national health authority in six union territories and now honorable pm has rolled it out to the whole country it is going to be a game changer not just in individual health but also in pandemic management how because it is going to create unique health ids it is going to have electronic health records in the health facilities. So, so right now, we let's say our system may be looking at a pregnant woman as a pregnant woman, but it's possible that she may have had TB earlier, which is not, which is not what we see when she comes for the maternal and maternal care, the pregnancy care. Through the health ID, we break these silos. And we are it. So it is a pregnant woman with low immunity who is also comorbid. She may have high BP. She may have diabetes. She may have other things. Once it comes in the system, even for pandemic management, she becomes somebody who is our priority. All the states, all the UTs have been screening comorbid populations routinely. You know, every three months they screen the whole. Uh, some states even you know and cities do it even more uh, they they screen the whole comorbid population and they know but just imagine with the creation of the unique health ids it is going to become such a game changer for us uh, not just in curative health but also in preventive health in what we call as the holistic health so uh, these are uh, just a few of the things uh, that COVID has taught us. It has also taught us that we need to reach to the last mile, to the last person out there. So even during COVID, the health ministry supplied the antiretroviral drugs for three months to people living with HIV AIDS. We supplied TB drugs for three months to people who had TB and needed to be on those drugs. So, so many things, you know, so one has to be agile, one has to be responsive, and one has to be proactive. Uh, with these words, uh, uh, I, uh, I'd like to end and uh, I welcome your suggestions and your inputs as we go ahead. Thank you so much once again. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, so glad that we could hear from Aarti as part of this panel. Um, so I think she's made you know a couple of important points about the fact that, you know, partnerships, evidence, um, being prepared. Um, and she's also talked a lot about the National Digital Health Mission. And, and maybe, you know, that's where we're going to, um, I think, bring in our first speaker, um, Steve Davis. Um, Steve, I mean, I know you have a vast experience in this field, but I think, you know, where we're wanting you to, I think, speak to today is really thinking about the technology and the digital sort of, you know, opportunities 
And obviously, I think COVID has put us through a set of constraints, which, you know, which have which have made us sort of rethink and accelerate and focus on those opportunities, the need to do physical distancing, the fact that we can't go to health facilities, the fact that the health system is, you know, is constrained and is under pressure like never before, um, has made us look at, you know, all the options on the table. And, and there's been a tremendous amount of momentum around digital platforms for many years now, but maybe COVID was the opportunity that sort of, you know, tipped things and accelerated it much more. I'd love to hear your perspectives on what are the constraints and, you know, what are sort of, you know, some of the opportunities that are emerging now. Well, well, first of all, thank you, um, Anand, and thank you all for uh, joining. Uh, and it was very interesting to listen to uh, the Honorable Minister, because I think that is the story that we need to unpack now that this has been a bit of a tale of two cities, the COVID, which on the one hand, devastating on so many levels, um, and it continues to devastate. Um, and and I don't, I, and I feel we have to be careful, we don't already go, as we go into learning mode, we still need to recognize we're still in the middle of this pandemic. Um, but, um, but, you know, as it relates to health systems, and then I'll get to the digital, you know, we really have seen a huge step backwards, sadly, on the, um, the COVID's, you know, in the most vulnerable parts of the world and lower and middle income communities, there's been a, a real backslide um, as it relates to primary care capabilities, some of the system building that was going on has been stalled out or, or moved backwards. We've seen the growing inequity that is the sort of the other big story that will always come with this pandemic is how badly the, the world is prepared for a more equitable approach to pandemics. Um, and we've seen, you know, very specific things uh, as it relates to vaccination rates uh, in, in many uh, communities have, have slowed down. We've, we've stepped backwards um, on, um, you know, on, 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 on mortality, morbidity has gone up. The impact on women and gender just is particularly acute. So we have a very um, challenging story. But I guess the, the other side of that story, and, and it gets to the digital, is there has been an extraordinary moment of innovation, of commitment, of collaboration, of people standing up. And this is not just government uh, who are, you know, uh, who's, who's are accountable for a lot of uh, this response, but uh, I've been very deeply involved in the private sector response over the last two years, and it's been tremendous on so many levels. And the innovation community has really stepped up. And we've seen, you know, not only, you know, the, the record breaking uh, ability to get this, uh, to get vaccines developed and out the door uh, is phenomenal. Uh, and even though the equitable access has been the challenge, but the, the speed of innovation has been phenomenal. And, and, um, and transparency around some of this has been quite good, et cetera. So I think on many marks, we should feel like we're seeing some, some momentum. So what does that all mean for a digital system and, and what does it mean for um, health systems trying to figure out how to do transformation to a more digitally enabled health system? Well, um, so I'll speak mainly, although I'm at the Gates Foundation and I teach at Stanford and I hold a couple other hats, I'll mainly speak from the work we're doing with WHO um, on the digital health transformation globally. And, you know, this has been a digital pandemic. I mean, look what we're doing right now. We're having this meeting um, in remotely and, and, and we've accelerated a lot of things digitally. And we have seen telemedicine now being not something that's sort of a remote idea, but now in many communities around the entire globe, we're seeing the utility of telemedicine has gone up and adoption rates are really phenomenal. The, um, you know, on every aspect of the sort of end-to-end -end pandemic, we have seen, you know, tools around tracking and tracing, some really great AI tools that have um, enabled us to, to figure out diagnosis quicker, even doing clinical trials on some of the vaccines have been quite impressive. Obviously, there's a lot of great telemedicine apps that are working on everything from mental health to, you know, just um, at, to so supporting uh, maternal uh, and, uh, and mother and child well-being. Um, and then we've also seen a lot of great tools around population support, like modeling tools, etc. So we have seen a lot of great stuff. However, 
a few problems. One is that a lot of it isn't reaching the people that need it the most. Um, so, and, and some of that is the in, built in inequity of global health systems already, but some of it is we don't have a very smart mechanism yet. Um, in fact, we hardly have one at all for getting the things, uh, the digital tools that people need, that ministers of health want, that uh, citizens want, that health authorities want. We don't have a very good process yet for connecting the innovation community with the the health systems um you know like in vaccines while it's cumbersome and it wasn't equal, very good in terms of equity we have you know capabilities like gavi and others that sort of act as the matchmaker between communities and 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 the and the and the uh, the, the vaccines we don't have that in digital very well and so we've got to really now come out of this thinking what are we going to do to sort of what is there needs to be a qualification or a vetting process how do we get these more sustainably financed what is the market making model um, the second is that we saw that there were very, very few rules around um, technical standards. Uh, and so a lot of the great tools that we saw were not um, interoperable, that we were finding that we were using spreadsheets to take data from one great app and transfer it to another tool without any connectivity between them. So that's a big problem that we hope that we've seen in the pandemic that will really directly affect, affect the health system. We've also seen, you know, the the larger question of policy around government data, data ownership, data governance. Uh, that is yet to be reconciled in most countries around the world, and there is not very much harmonization there. So we have some big, big challenges ahead to make um, these digital tools and data platforms more uh, uh, meaningful. That said. And I want to underscore uh, what the health minister just was saying. The, they they are going to be a game changer. I, I I don't mean to suggest that you know the biology and chemistry don't still matter in health. Uh, bits and bytes are not going to take over that. But the opportunities over the next decade for us to really support transformation at national and subnational levels of health systems using data, data platforms, improving data culture. It's not just about the capabilities, but it's about the, the learning how to actually uh, it permit people to make decisions with the data they get access to um, and giving um, more, uh, uh, building more trust. One of the things that we saw in uh, some amazing um, citizens and engagement tools where you are willing to say and share where you were and what you were doing in order for us to track and trace the pandemic. But that takes a set of trust building that we're going to have that needs to be worked on in these health systems and it affects different communities differently. So I think that we're going to see a lot of work over the next decade to get to this right. But but it is transformative. And one a couple of things I want to mention and then I'll close out is we measure that on lots of different levels around the world. And I've spent a lot of time, I ran PATH in India for a year and I've spent a lot of time in India. And I know the tremendous amount of work that's being done on the digital transformation there. But it's not just clinical um, outcomes, which is sort of core to our, our metric of success here. You know, can we identify something quicker? Can we get smarter at our diagnostics? Can we have a higher level of treatment? Can we get track and, you know, we're, get the, uh, the silos problem solved so we're, we do know the whole patient and the whole, the whole community? But it's also, an, a, a, you know, she needs to be measured by productivity. We, we've seen the uh, efforts in Tanzania to move to a paperless system and some really great work that's happened there. We're seeing, you know, the big challenge thing that happened there was that you saw a frontline health worker open up 50, 60 percent of her time has been now, you know, opened up to actually treat patients and not just record data um, and often record data for someone else to use and not even to you for her to use. So, um, there is, uh, you know, a, a lot to be said for for productivity. I'm quite excited. I think India is actually, in many ways, leading the globe, or could be leading the globe. I mean, we've never really scaled up globally 
a, a set of health tools like India is, set, is doing in the, in the, in the digital health uh, field for community with community care and also the, the tool being used in India for COVID. Both of those have gone to scale in a way that's unprecedented. And I think we can learn a lot from what went right, what went wrong. It wasn't, certainly wasn't flawless at all, but there's, there's a lot we can learn there. So um, it's just a really exciting field. I think there's a lot coming out of the pandemic that we can learn, and I think we'll be better for it. Um, but as you know, there's lots of, you know, the sustainable financing, sorting out the, the data governance issues, um, getting people to be willing to hook their systems together and bringing in the private sector. The private sector is who's going to drive all this innovation. We can't do it without them. And, and we've got to figure out better ways to embrace them. Over. Thank you. You've lined it up really well. So many of those issues I'm going to come back to uh, when we do our Q&A, but you ended with the point about the parole, important role of the private sector. And so Bianca, spotlights on you. Um, given your vast experience of working with the private sector across a broad range of issues, you know, not just COVID, but looking at many other diseases um, as well at, at the Global Fund. Um, again, tell us about, you know, I think We've heard, you know, again, even, you know, Arthi spoke about the fact that, you know, we, we saw the sort of the amazing sort of coming together, the corralling of forces of, of multiple different partners, uh, the government with the private sector, with civil society, with citizens, individuals, um, everyone coming together and the private sector did an amazing job. Maybe let's just hear about sort of, you know, how has the private sector been responding? What has been enabling? What has been constraints that they're dealing with? And again, some ideas about what the future might hold. Sure, with pleasure. And thanks a lot, Anand and Steve as well. <laughs> Indeed, you laid a, the, the perfect introduction and um, I'm very happy to, to follow up on that. And a huge thank you, obviously, for, for having me here and for, for having the voice of the Global Fund represented in one way or the other. So I'm, I'm happy to contribute. Um, on that note, maybe let me briefly start just by giving a, a short introduction of the Global Fund, because I suppose many of the, the people joining us today may not be completely familiar with it. Um, so just as a very brief recap, so we um, are the world's main or the major organization um, that was created 20 years ago to fight the, the three deadliest epidemics of our time until COVID um, came along. Um, so HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria. And um, one of our big roles also is to invest in health systems. So in fact, one billion of the around, uh, a bit more than four billion at the Global Fund um, disperses to around um, 100 countries per per year um, is actually designed for investing in the underlying health system. So the people, the data systems um, that Steve was talking about, supply chain, um, laboratories and, and everything around that. But I think one very important point to make beyond like the, the, the funding mechanism role, the Global Fund is really a movement because we were created out of, uh, a, well, I, I wouldn't call it a similar situation, but also a public health crisis um, at that time. So the HIV AIDS, um, a pandemic that was uh, ravaging the world back then. And um, so there was a real need to create an institution that can not only drive down prices and distribute um, treatments and drugs, but really tackle the, the, the three diseases and um, well, end those. That is actually our, our main goal. So that's what we're, what we're here for. And just very briefly in terms of some of the core principles that were built on and that I think that are um, very unique as well to the Global Fund partnership model um, is um, that we are built on, on what you mentioned, Anand, as well, um, well, equality and inclusion. So making sure that everyone is in, uh, involved, I mean, from the people um, affected by the diseases, but the governments, I mean, both the donor governments and the implementing governments, um, the partner governments, and India has been uh, a longstanding partner in, in that whole fight against um, diseases with us. Um, but then also, uh, well, diversity and partnership. And when we speak about the, the fund, I mean, partnership means that the private sector sits at the table with governments, um, with civil society, with communities, um, and that it's really like an example for that collective action to take. And um, I, I wanted to make that, um, that introduction because it then links us to, to the situation that we're in now. Um, I mean, we also, we have a a big role to play. We're a key partner um, and, and one of our strongest partners with the, the Gates Foundation, the international community, also in the Access to COVID Tools Accelerator. Um, so actually another and very, I think, unprecedented uh, global collective action to now fight COVID-19 and to make sure that 
um, we bridge some of the equity gaps that we're seeing and that, that Steve was talking about now as well, and that we get the, the vaccines, but of course also the treatments and the oxygen and the PPE um, and the treatments, I mean, now that they're hopefully coming through along the line as well to where they're, they're needed most. So we really see this collective action in action and we see that it's working. I mean, for like the other three diseases, I mean, the, the other three, the, 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 the other three deadly epidemics, um, we've half the um, the number of deaths um, since like the, the, the beginning of um, well, the, this effort. But um, what we're seeing as well, that COVID is having like a real knock on impact um, on, I mean, of course, I mean, the, the impact of COVID on health systems and um, well, the, the devastation that we're seeing in, in many countries around the world. But also we're seeing for the first time in the 20 years, the numbers of other epidemics going up. And why I'm referring to that is um, mostly to say that, I mean, we're not fighting specific diseases. When we're talking about building back better, there's a real need, A, to build on what we've already created. So the health systems that we've built now, the infrastructure, the people, the training, the capacities, all of that um, we've seen in, in COVID-19 that it has been repurposed and actually quite quickly to respond like to COVID-19. And those are the, I mean, if we can call it like the muscles that, that we've built and that we will then be able to use to also fight, um, well, COVID-19 right now, but also prepare for future pandemics and, and respond to them. And um, in that sense, private sector that has been involved so closely like in the fight against um, other diseases has a real role to play and if I can make that point uh, up front as well we have seen the private sector stepping up and there's a lot of like I mean exciting initiatives coming forward but we can all I mean there's a lot of space to do more especially if we know that we have, have to invest now and we have to build the systems now um, that that will then um, prevent us from the from future diseases to come and which will come and quite frankly as well um, I think a, a lot of the, the the private sector I mean both the companies but but in, in general I mean and that's something that we share with um, with governments as well have not had um, pandemics or like the like public health crisis of this magnitude on the on the radar so there's the need to anticipate that and to invest and to, to make certain things happen now um, and if I can just um, make three or throw in three ideas um, just to, to also open them up for, for discussion. I mean, what we have seen, for example, I mean, if we speak about the private sector being a key part of the Global Fund Partnership, I mean, there's a range of, uh, of ways that, that can manifest itself. But one important one is market shaping, demand creation, and bringing in, I mean, the, the, the products, the treatments that really save lives and working with us and with governments. And that's again, where the collective action comes in um, to create the markets for those, to, to bring them to the countries that otherwise would not have access to those um, um, well, life-saving tools and at the same time driving down prices. So for example, for antiretroviral treatments for HIV, um, it's one of those success stories where from like more than tens of thousands of dollars, we drove down the price to now $90 um, for uh, a course of this treatment per year that keeps one person alive. And that's like a real partnership and, and collaboration together with the private sector. And I also want to, to really highlight the, the Indian private sector here, because as we all know, India is the powerhouse for global vaccine um, manufacturing, but also other treatments, generics, um, other drugs. And uh, it's really, it's, it's incredible. I mean, what the, the Indian private sector and overall the private sector has done and, and the potential that we have there now for, for all other tools that we need for, for COVID-19. And when we speak about building back better, of course, like there's the core innovation that is happening in the private sector. And we will not defeat any of the diseases we're tackling with now or prepare ourselves for other diseases if we don't continue, if, if we continue to do things as we have been doing now. We've seen success, but also we're hitting some of the roadblocks. And Steve, you mentioned it really well in terms of like the digital, there are like real barriers there that we need to break through and we will need the private sector for that. And I mean, that relates to data, digital health, of course, but it's, I mean, if you look at supply chains um, about, um, well, laboratories, new products, and I mean, the, the vaccines that we have now, like this innovation for COVID-19 is a prime example because actually the vaccines, the development of the vaccines was done at an unprecedented speed and scale. 
But now the rollout of those vaccines is taking even longer than the actual development because we need those systems in place and we need the people in place and the structures um, that can make sure that, that those tools reach um, those who need them as well. So the private sector has a, re a real role to play in terms of innovation, but also seed funding and providing that access to market. And as a third point, and um, I think that's probably an evident one, but um, of course the local private sector is absolutely key. So we can't only speak about like global partnerships, um, but we have to look into the role that the local private sector can play. I mean, of course, we look at the private health providers that are a key part of any health system. And so if you build then systems that can handle pandemics, the private sector just has to be a, a part of this in terms of like being integrated in the national response, using the same standards, the same policies, driving them um, forward as well. And um, another point that, that Steve made as well is looking into, and um, we saw it in the video of, of um, RT um, as well, um, the, the local capacity for manufacturing, I mean, local PPE manufacturing, for example, um, there's, I mean, a huge opportunity there and a huge opportunity for the world to invest, but also local private sector to work with governments. And let me close on, on one point and I want to come back to like the, the really inspiring video about, um, and then just the whole message about the pandemic as a portal and the opportunity. I mean, on the one hand, this is an opportunity for us to do things differently and for the private sector to, to step up and to, to grasp that and maybe learn from what has not happened um, before and, and really adapt quickly, which is another like key capacity the private sector has. But also um, we all know that equity and inclusion are not necessarily ingrained in markets and any market-based approach. So there's also the need um, I mean, in closing to, to really drive that collective action. And that's part of the role that organizations like, like us and our partners, um, the ACT Accelerator, um, other uh, partners in, in that space, foundations and private sector can play. Um, and that's also a huge opportunity then to work with governments and, and to make sure that there's the integrated response and that, um, yeah, in that sense, like the different capacities and, and the different responsibilities as well come together. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, and I think that does, I think you, you, you're, you're stating it quite wonderfully in terms of just sort of encapsulating the fact that the pandemic has, you know, is not something that anyone was ready for. And in that situation, in this sort of dark moment, all of our systems, whether it's market systems, whether it's health systems, whether it's public systems, whether it's civil society systems, were at a point of breakdown. And when they're at a point of a breakdown, they malfunction. They malfunction and the question is, one is how do you learn from it and how do you sort of think about um, preparing for these? But, and you know, and also what are we learning um, from those? I, 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 and I'm, and I'm, thank you so much. I'm just seeing these comments uh, and questions um, coming in here. Keep them coming in, we will come back. Um, to some of those, and, and I do have more questions I will follow up with you, uh, Bianca. Um, uh, Radharani, one of the, you know, you come from this sort of tremendous experience of having worked on a lot, a lot of what I know as being sort of, you know, really important and really difficult um, behavioral issues, right? How do you, how do you sort of get to changing that? And this is something, again, the pan this pandemic has unearthed like never before, right? It's, it's just, and it's again, it's been all of that perfect storm. You know, it's, it's, it's going into an uncharted territory of science and technology in an arena where information is rife and everyone is an expert every single minute of their lives, okay? Um, and the scientists are also figuring out what's going on. So, you know, people are sort of figuring out uh, as we're, you know, literally sort of flying. Um, and we, you know, we know that there is, I mean, I think that the key issue is the issues of sort of like information, but the other key issues of trust, right? In this sort of, you know, in this society and in this uh, time and age, how do we sort of go about trying to, again, build back better with respect to being able to try and inform knowledge, inform behaviors, shape behaviors, but in a way that's really competing with everybody being an expert and everybody being a font of some sort of wisdom, you know, that, that we have seen. So I'd love to hear, you know, again, some of your experiences of what you've been seeing, how, how things were working, were not working, what broke down, but also what we're learning from that. Thank you, Anand. And thank you, Sankalp and my co-panelists. Um, at BBC Media Action, we believe in the power of media and communication for good. 
We believe information is empowering. That's what helps in building healthy, resilient, and inclusive communities. The pandemic, as we know, has exacerbated insecurity, inequality, and poverty. But if we have to use this as a portal, and Anand, that film was really inspiring, into a new normal, then what role can communication play in building back with equity and inclusivity? And there's one word, one key word I want to focus on, and you've already mentioned it, and that's trust. So let's do one thing. Let's visualize trust as the bullseye. And I'd like to look at uh, five arrows that could fit, hit the spot. And I will use the uh, pandemic as a kind of filter to look at these um, five arrows. So the first thing I wanted to talk about is communication is always a continuum. And it's particularly true of COVID. If communication has to shape how people think, feel, and do, let's look at the four components from the Rogers and Maddox protection motivation theory. So perceived severity of the threat, perceived vulnerability to the threat, perceived efficacy of protective behaviors, and perceived self-efficacy in executing those behaviors. Therefore, we at BBC Media Action, and this is experience uh, sort of uh, you know, gathered from across many of our country programs. Uh, we believe that COVID-19 communication needs to be a continuum and it has to contain several thematic focus areas. And all of it has to actually do with uh, trust as a pivot. So what are these behaviors or what could be these thematic areas? COVID appropriate behavior, because the time for that is not yet over. Vax communication, so where and how to get vaccinated, how long after getting vaccinated do you develop immunity? Why is CAB recommended between vaccines? Myths and misconceptions leading to vax hesitancy. What does home care look like in a resource poor setting, say like a village in Bihar in India, where the family would certainly not have a pulse oximeter like the people on this panel or know what proning is. Why is it even necessary? So timely, accurate information from trusted sources where information is just not information, but communication can help people distinguish between compliant and non-compliant behaviors. We have seen in our sanitation work how social disapproval for non-compliant behavior can actually promote norms of pro-social behavior, which in turn can then build trust. The second arrow was about this science or the science that we have so far talked about is going to need some art and craft. And these are again, you know, general observations um, from experience gathered over years on working, uh, of working on health communication. Simply presenting facts in a scientific way is insufficient. Uh, in changing attitudes and beliefs around COVID appropriate behavior and vaccines. And it's true of HIV, we've seen that, it's true of the, uh, TB, it's true of Ebola when we were working on Ebola, you know, in a 2014 outbreak. The behavioral barriers to both CAB and vaccines in this case are deeply rooted in experience and culture and further entrenched by misinformation and peer pressure. And that is, and those things are compelling and driven by emotion. Remember that those are not coming from any scientific corner in somebody's head and heart. Communication aimed at building trust has to respond to people's real fears. It needs to connect emotionally, tap into people's values, feature trusted leaders, and allow space for people to voice their concerns. Alongside the science, therefore, we need creative strategies and execution, the art and craft of effective communication. This can include narratives that focus on dialogue, not preaching. We need socio-cultural insights, not just scientific insights, not just you know, technical insights. We need big ideas, stories, and storytellers. We need, very importantly, new language for frontline health workers and influencers, and we need interesting, engaging formats. And, you know, a lot of this is also dependent on issues of equity, like the digital divide and so on and so forth. And I think we need to disrupt. And I think the uh, pandemic as a portal is the biggest disruption we have seen in our lives. And, you know, if that has happened, then why can't we disrupt through communication? At BBC Media Action, um, 
Anand, we've been designing strategies and creating outputs on COVID communication over the past year and a half. Uh, we are talking about some really vulnerable and marginalized communities here, uh, urban poor in IDP camps in Somalia, the general population and the Kuchis, which is the biggest nomadic tribe in Afghanistan in informal waste pickers in, Af in, in Bengaluru. I'll give you some, uh, just, just a kind of a you know, hint of what we have learned from the work in uh, Somalia and Afghanistan, because the work in Bangaluru has still not gone out into the field. The radio and TV PACs in Afghanistan and Somalia have used familiar, identified, respected, and loved characters and influences, and then have challenged cultural norms to motivate people to practice preventive measures. Evaluative research has shown that audiences reported new detailed knowledge about hand washing as their biggest learning from the PACs. So these are communities who did not know that hand washing meant washing hands with soap, you know. Um, in both countries, our reach and engagement studies have shown that the viewers and listeners have discussed the PSAs with others, both within and outside the family. And we have proven evidence over years, and Anand, you bear testimony to this, that uh, conversation is a gateway for change, right? So we need to we need to design and shape creative outputs and strategies, but we then need to throw them out back at the audience target segment so that they can talk and, you know, they can, you know, uh, and change can happen. The third arrow was that data will help us understand gender inequity in vaccine update. I think we should all take a good hard look at COVID-19 data for vax demand and uptake from India and ask what the figures are saying and who is it true of. So for in instance, in the first phase of vaccination, the data showed a very high percentage of women getting vaccinated. But that was because frontline healthcare workers, who are poor, badly paid women at the bottom of the care hierarchy, were mandated to take it, right? When vaccination was opened up to the general population, we have seen the number of women have dropped, has dropped significantly. This initial trend shows that data needs careful examination to understand its peaks and troughs before one gets complacent and says, that vaccine uptake is an area of equality. We need to interrogate and analyze data to mine for insights that can help create communication strategies to shape demand and drive vaccine uptake amongst women in our country. And this is India specific. The fourth arrow is of course about managing the infodemic, which is a word that has entered all our lexicons. So technology we know, and Steve and Bianca have both talked about this in detail, plays a huge role in shaping the information environment. While it's critical to use algorithms to reduce exposure to mis and disinformation, these are only part of the solution. See, algorithms can shut down searches, right? But they have no impact on private messaging apps in village squares and at kitchen tables. Lay people are not journalists. They aren't trained to fact check. In spite of this, we simply haven't seen enough being done to equip the general population communities on how to process information. As you yourself said, Anand, everybody is an expert. So how do people develop that muscle and that critical judgment of faculty to question, is this true or not? So how can we mine more insights, learn from the experts, who know how to make that distinction and give people simple doable actions like stop and think before you click on that share button so that you can help them stop the spread. Last year, very early on in the pandemic, we did do a little bit of work on this and we use social media platforms to disseminate this message. But then again, you know, there was that digital divide and that could only reach people who are on smartphones and have ownership and access to data. This area needs more significant in investment because it's a critical component in building trust. But I would also like to make another point here that alongside digital solutions, we need to use and strengthen more equitable platforms such as community radio stations. You know, we need to use them more. We need to build, back, build them back better. And we need to create a body of evidence that will help us reach people who are not, who are, you know, who lie on the other side of the digital divide. And the last thing is about sustainability and adaptive programming. This is a long haul virus. And yes, I'm using the COVID pandemic as, as the headline arrow here. And it requires long haul communication, but that's true of 
every other type of health communication. Throughout the last 18 months, we've all seen the ever-changing nature of this pandemic. Communication strategies have to be adaptable and responsive. They have to be timely. So there's no point in talking about hand washing, say when the second wave is happening and people are just, you know, uh, running helter skelter to look for oxygen or people want to know how can I stay out of hospital what is it that we can do you know there is fear and confusion everywhere so tactical approaches which are strategic because tactical has to be strategic as well have to counter whatever the pandemic and the infodemic throw up next as individual and community experiences with the pandemic change, so will attitudes towards, towards COVID appropriate behavior, towards vaccine, towards usage of platforms, you know, uh, digital platforms, using digital tools, um, using digital communication. And therefore, behavioral insights research will have to be invested in and will need to be mined over and over again. This cannot be a one campaign approach. And I'm talking in terms of social and behavior change communication. Communication content for health workers and the elderly will have to be different for communication for youth, rural and urban communication content has to be, you know, they have to be different. Uh, people who are being reached digitally will have to look at communication in a different way. We have to design differently for people who are not digitally equipped, okay? And we have to reflect different motivations, perceptions of risk, influences, and media habits. It's very, very important for us to invest and really, really do, you know, um, evidence, evidence sort of uh, based insight driven uh, work and it has to be sustained and evolved over time we saw as with hiv and it's continuing with uh, tb and malaria and this is a marathon it's not a sprint it will require patience time resources both financial human technical and you know psychosocial and we are in it for the long haul because uh, anand to just get back to the pivot word trust Trust doesn't get built in a day. So that's what I just have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we're going to come back to, again, some of those issues. Um, thank you so much for these opening and these um, sort of, I think, uh, uh, key thoughts and, and, and remarks. I guess a couple of questions I wanted to sort of dig back on. And, and, and these are, I'm going, to, I'm going to point the first set of questions towards Steve, but I'd love to hear other people's perspective, because I think some of these may be cross-cutting sorts of questions. On the issue about the digital um, sort of platforms, I think one of the things we've heard from all of the speakers is issues about equity of access, um, digital access. And just, you know, given the fact that there is there is the reality in a landscape that um, not, you know, digital tools will not be accessible. You yourself talked about this, Steve, will not be accessible, you know, to everyone. And I guess the other reality is that we know that the digital tools have to exist in a brick and mortar world as well. With dig the digital platforms have to exist in a world where there are doctors, there are clinics, there are health providers, there are medicines, um, there are procedures, et cetera. And, and I guess one of the things I'm thinking about is sort of some of the things I've learned about from the private sector where there is this, you know, there's a phrase that's used, which is called the total market approach. The idea that how do you look at the, at, you know, at, at the world as a total market woven together with different types of players. What are we learning about the digital space, thinking about, again, about the health system as a total health system? And where is it that, you know, the digital platforms come in useful? Um, what are the roles that, you know, that they can play again? And, and, and I'm hoping that, you know, some of this will also go back to um, RT as well. And I think, you know, in her pivotal role as she's thinking about sort of, you know, what's the role of digital health and National Digital Health Authority, any, any suggestions about how do we think about, you know, the development and the creation of a digital platform in that overarching and recognizing that it's a weak health system that we are dealing with. So we're trying to build for that and support for that. You're on my own. Two years in and I still do that too often. Um, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a really great question. Um, and it is a it's a complicated uh, quilt that we're we're weaving here. That you've got to, I mean, first of all, um, I mean, look, take it from a global perspective. One of the things we've done in the, the with the work at the WHO is look at digital maturity levels. So we have to uh, assume that, <coughs> excuse me, different health systems 
are in very different, uh, and this is at the subnational level as well as the national level, are at, at different levels of ab ability to take on digital capabilities and adapt. Um, some of that is purely an infrastructure problem in terms of, uh, but a lot of it is more to do with, you know, kind of having the digital culture in place and, uh, you know, getting the willingness of, of the care providers to use the tools, um, training. There's a variety of things that have to come along with that. So, um, so I do think there's a consciousness that this cannot be throw, you know, throw cool tools at people and assume they'll be used. That, that, that just has proven to be an utter disaster over and over again. Um, a couple other things. You know, one of the things that I think is great about uh, a digital tool, and I'll, you know, I'm obviously an evangelist uh, in in many of these areas, is that they are highly adaptive, and so, you know, it's not like here it is, it's going to be this way forever. You can um, uh, almost by definition change the um, tweak algorithms will change the way that um, the tool can be used will will also change. So. You know, one of the good things we have is the ability to kind of keep monitoring this and getting feedback loops and adjusting. And so that's going to be important, too. <clears throat> Sorry. The, the third thing I want to mention is, um, you know, I do think that uh, the private sector market model is actually not a bad one to use. Now, we have to address the issue that is very clearly, you know, uh, highlighted in the chat that the private sector's profit motive means that we are going to have to figure out ways to provide incentives so those kind of investments can come forward. On the other hand, um, you know, the, <clears throat> the ability of having a larger platform is you actually have market pressure and purchasing power to put pressure on that. And so that's important, and the, and the Global Fund does that brilliantly. So those are a few things that I'll say, and I have a frog in my throat, so I'll throw it over to someone else. <laughs> I'm going to let you get some water and maybe throw it across to Bianca, because you did bring in the private sector. And I think that question about how does one, you know, we did see sort of a breakdown of market dynamics to a certain extent. And I think there's some questions sort of alluding to that. Um, uh, in the chat is that, you know, there was, there was, you know, to some extent, tremendous sort of, you know, profit making as, as, yeah, as, you know, as there was this like massive rush towards like finding medicine or finding oxygen or finding various things. And I guess, you know, we, we've, we, we've created, you know, regulations and frameworks for markets on a normal day, right? What are we learning about regulations or markets in a pandemic situation, if anything? Because it, it clearly is an un, un, unprecedented, you know, <laughs> situation, but would we do try and do anything differently in, in this situation if this were to repeat again? I don't know if there's any thoughts about that. That's a very big question <laughs> and a very complex one. So let me try to untangle just a few of them, of those elements. And I think, I mean, A, I mean, you and, and also you, Steve, I mean, when you speak about like the, the market approach in general, I mean, you're completely right. I mean, it, it's, it doesn't mean that it has to be completely negative, like from the start. I think the question is, I mean, how do you use those forces and how do you use the different actors? I mean, if you say like there's a global market approach, um, it's not only about private sector. And in that sense, not only about pharmaceutical companies. So it's, it's really, it's a very complex field that we're dealing with. And I think what, what COVID has shown us, um, we did run into these exceptional shortages and like situations because the world was not prepared. Um, and I mean, we, we, I can only refer back also to like the, the, the three um, pandemics, I mean, that we've been, uh, that have been around for like centuries and that we know quite well, we have not been able to defeat these either. Uh, I mean, just to say like this, what um, Vatarani said as well, this is a long haul um, and it, it will take like these long, like really sustainable investments, like long-term investments. And I think COVID has shown us that there's a lot out there that we have not been prepared for, that we did not invest in. And that we then like found ourselves in like bottlenecks that the world has never seen before. And we're seeing the ripple effects. I mean, now way beyond the, the health systems effects, but now I mean, economies and so on that have been struggling under that. Um, I do hope though, that this is sort of like a, a wake up call in one way or the other. 
but also that um, building on some of the market-based models and the experiences that we have, and also then, I mean, in, in cooperation with governments and with that, I mean, especially like the governments in, in all the countries and like those driving policies as well and investments in, in certain um, certain sectors, that um, there is a lot of learning coming from this and that we're seeing not only the the benefits or like the immediate like relief and in investing in in for example oxygen now and like deploying that and rolling it out um as fast as possible but they we're now changing to like more structural investments and that's like where the real um the opportunity is on many different levels so we're investing now in oxygen plants and concentrators and in like those structures and not only like in a few countries that then can then supply that to the world, but like in different parts of the world. And there's a very interesting um, uh, conversation going on about uh, production capacity while well, in the global south, in different countries and different hubs and different regions. So um, just to say, I think there's a lot already happening there. And I, I do see, I mean, I have, I'm a very optimistic person anyways, and I do think there's, um, uh, a lot good of good coming out of there. And just one point um, to make as well, as we think of building back better and looking forward, I mean, the whole question around surveillance is a very important one as well. So in terms of investing in those structures, and again, that's like where you you don't, you don't can't only rely on um, government supported systems, but that's where the private sector has a key role to play for the tools for like the, I mean, from like the private um, health facilities that are part of a surveillance system. And in, I mean, when we build back better, we have to think about how do we prevent another pandemic like that to happen again? Or if it happens, how do we contain it as quickly as possible? And what do we need to build now um, to prevent that? Um, well, and getting us into like a similar situation. And I might just jump in with my voice back that uh, your 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 point about the regulatory uh, structure is very critical as we look at a number of action items that we've sort of called actions that are being uh, developed as we speak around what needs to happen ahead of the next pandemic. How do we learn respond the idea that we're going to have to work more closely with regulators and and get more harmonization that's been a huge problem and it's not just the vaccine side it's on on the ppe on the drugs on and so we'll what i hope that that will be one of the 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 actionable things that we can actually do i i'm gonna I, one other question follow-up question bianca i think is uh and again this is open to everyone what about everything else that the world was dealing with in terms of health, right? So, you know, because Global Fund is dealing with, you know, huge issues, TB, malaria, HIV, etc. These have all sort of, we feel, you know, been sort of, have they been put on hold? Are they still continuing? How do we get back to those things? And again, is there anything that we're learning from this experience that helps us to accelerate those areas of work? Specifically, again, thinking from private sector aspect of what we're learning from COVID, the partnerships and the engagement, and I think the innovation, the investment, does that in any way sort of enable the game with respect to TB, malaria, and, and, and many, many other health issues that we need to deal with? Absolutely. I mean, I mean, I could not uh, like emphasize that that point more that that you're making because this is, I mean, what we really have to be clear on. These are not separate fights, or like you can't like deal with one epidemic without the other. I mean, one, I mean, they're all linked. Public health issues are linked, and if we're talking about defeating a disease, an infectious disease, it's it's not just about like getting treatments and like prevention and all of that out there. It's a lot about, I mean, the structural inequities. I mean, Radrani, you mentioned gender inequality, inequities, um, like huge issues that are driving disease, access to health services. Um, uh, I mean, discrimination, also like legal the issues. Divide. Yeah. So yeah. I just want to really emphasize also that, that that whole point about, um, I mean, when we look at public health issues, it's not just about disease as such and like R&D and just making sure you have innovation and tools. It's about looking like a, well, a whole um, society-based or community-based um, yeah. approach to that. And um, that also creates, I mean, huge complexities. Uh, I mean, we're seeing it. I mean, I mentioned it in my 
brief introduction that we're seeing the knock-on effect on COVID-19 directly. And that means uh, from COVID-19 on other diseases and health issues. Um, so that leads to, I mean, just to throw out a few examples. Yes, we see like the number of uh, missed cases um, of missed referrals going up like hugely for the three diseases that we're monitoring, but also we see rates of gender-based violence going up. We're seeing less um, fever treatment for children, for example, because uh, I mean, there's a huge issue of like access to those. And then, uh, I mean, with overwhelmed health facilities and lockdowns and so on, in impacting all of that. So all of that to say, this is all of the same fight. And if we fight, no matter which disease, we're also fighting COVID-19 and we're building the structures that are going to be needed for all, um, all other diseases um, to come as well. And to your point on like the, the role of the private sector, um, I think, I mean, again, like there's, there's so much opportunity space, just using that lens as well. And yes, you can look into like uh, market-based products even that are solutions or like low profit. I mean, there's a, the real space there and we haven't even touched upon investments um, yet that can come from the private sector and really accelerate and, and trigger um, some of those uh, well new approaches, different approaches, and really inclusive approaches that then also are more sustainable and that can also bring a profit. But um, I just want to make a very brief point um, on a question that I briefly skimmed in, in the chat about um, the role of CSR in this as well. Of course, this is one approach, but I think going forward, um, if we say that we all need to put health on the agenda, um, be it public or private sector or others, we have to have this on, on our radar um, as like a, a real risk um, that we need to deal with and tackle into um, tackle with. Um, there will be more, well, there's opportunity space and more needs to be done beyond CSR as well. So really like in, including health investments in the core business and using the core business, like those core capability, capabilities that can be even like out of health to then like find new solutions that, that address um, the health issues of, of our times. Anand, if I may come in here for a minute, um, this is also what the pandemic has shown us, and this is not, not new, but this realization or observation should be really put to use is about the intersectionality. Because when we say build back better, we are not only talking about building health systems back better. There is, you know, so what's happening with gender-based violence at police stations? Why has reportage, you know, gone down? Because there, there are no cops, right? And I'm talking about experience that I've heard shared among stakeholders during these last 18 months. What has happened to education? You know, so how can private sector, how can communication play a role in actually making up for nearly a lost generation, a generation of kids and, uh, you know, older adolescents and young adults losing out on education, literally for 18 months. Then there is also this whole thing of, you know, planning sort of planning in partnership with others. So I, I actually have been quite disappointed and I include myself, you know, I'm speaking on behalf of the sector that I represent and also private sector because my provenance is private sector. I, come, I came to BBC Media Action from the world of media and advertising and marketing where I, we haven't seen people coming together to actually plan and strategize and shape uh, communication that can take care or that can address these other issues, right? And there's been a sense of let's wait and watch, but you know, speed is also of the essence. And yes, in speeding things up, we will make mistakes. And Steve, you uh, alluded to that as well, but mistakes are also lessons, you know, we learn from, right? So I think that uh, in terms of even wax hesitancy, the, uh, the vaccine has taken a year to be developed, you know, and I was talking to some uh, cancer scientists in the UK where I am now, and, you know, we have seen vaccines taking 10 years, then taking five years, and, you know, now it's been done in a year, but wax hesitancy communication has not yet been you know, done to scale. And when I say scale, I don't mean one size fits all kind of communication. I say, you know, what is being done to tackle wax communication. So there has been a, there have been two, there have been two real challenges and we need to really look into ourselves 
uh, individually as organizations, as sectors, to, to, to ensure that we don't make repeat these same things. One is the lack of inter, the, the, a better understanding of intersectionality, that it's not just about building the health system back better. And the other is partnerships and planning ahead. We have to be ahead of the challenge rather than be, be behind the challenge when the next crisis happens or when the next wave happens. You know, we are all looking at waves of vax hesitancy happening in India now, even though the numbers are huge. Naturally, you're talking about, a, you know, a pop look at, look at, uh, look at uh, the global north and vax hesitancy. But where is work happening on vax hesitancy in a sustained manner? And I think it's a real, real problem. And it is being um, further exacerbated by misinformation about what problems vaccinations are causing, you know which is being spread by anti-vaxxers. And there are fence sitters. So what do we do with fence sitters? And I'll just share, I'll just share a tiny example. I don't have evidence yet to share with you, but we have been working uh, uh, to sort of, you know, improve the lot of uh, perceptions about informal uh, waste pickers in the city of Bengaluru in South India as part of a collective impact initiative. And we have just done, uh, two vax hesitancy outputs. They are films that are going to be used in outreach with the informal waste pickers by two of our other partners, Save the Children and Hasiruddala. You know, they have, Hasiruddala has been a sort of a champion and a real sort of leader in working with informal waste pickers, where we have taken early lessons from HIV and condom use of, you know, addressing fence sitters. Don't talk to the anti-vaxxers because they're very, very set in their ways don't talk to people who have you know, who are already you know positive but talk to the fence sitters because they're looking here and they're looking there they're listening to two types of things and how do we get them to come to you know adopt vaccines so there are lots of things to be done and i think i think you know there is there has to be time is of the essence and there has to be a little bit more um, of a risk taking appetite to invest in these interventions if because this is the biggest risk. What could be more risky than, you know, the whole world coming to a virtual end? So I think we have to sharpen our risk appetites a little bit more, at least when I look at what's being done in the field of communication with communities, because there's no point in, you know, developing products and services if there is no uptake, right? So I do that's think that's an important that point, because I think that's something, up. it's something that the pandemic has forced us is to think in a very time sensitive manner with a sense of urgency. I know that as, as someone who works with a, you know, with a funding organization, we, we are under pressure to think about how and where to, you know, make these investments, et cetera. And what you will tend to do then is to go for the obvious ones, right? There is a vaccine hesitancy, let's do fund someone to do that campaign. What someone else comes and tells us, however, is that there's actually a large percentage of people who are not vaccine hesitant at all. They just don't know where to go, how to use that damn app, which papers to take with them when they go for it, what to expect. So it's not vaccine hesitancy in terms of a fear, but there's a very large percentage. Now, what are you gonna to do to get them over the edge, right? So as you're saying, those fence sitters, right? Can we just sort of work on that? You know, again, when we were thinking about like, you know, well, we need to roll out, you know, oxygen supply into places, you know, we would say, well, actually there's a lot of places which have got these oxygen concentrators, but all the instruction manuals are in Mandarin. Can you please have in the in English, you know, instruction manuals and just do that kind of stuff? Or someone's got, you know, large PSA plants, but they don't have the piping and the generator to run the PSA plant. So how do we sort of, you know, do those things? So I think there is this sort of issue about thinking. I think, you know, I think pandemic has sort of helped us think a little bit more about how to make those investment decisions, but really make it on our toes as well. I realize we're, you know, we've got about 12, 13 minutes uh, left and, and there are a bunch of questions coming in from the audiences. So I'm gonna um, start sort of uh, throwing them uh, your way. So maybe Bianca, the first one is Global Fund had some innovative programs to use unconventional companies such as Coca-Cola to support in health, especially with supply chains. How sustainable has that proven to be? And are you developing something similar to that on a larger scale for the future? Sure, very happy to speak to that. And I think it's one of those examples where like a non-health company comes together with us and we have a, a range of those partnerships. I mean, just to name a few others as well. I mean, to the digital uh, point, I mean, with Google, IBM, MasterCard, um, Microsoft. So 
we're looking like into different spaces and on that side, I mean, we're working with um, quite a few corporates to find uh, unconventional um, solutions. And I, I think just one um, point to make here, which again, um, relates to the sustainability question, I think. Uh, um, one point I haven't mentioned about the way that the fund works is that we work through country leadership or country ownership. So every country is um, like in charge of developing the strategies for the health systems building uh, and strengthening, um, but also for, I mean, the disease response and then like applying for the funding to the global fund and then we enter in this partnership. And so it's like really everything is driven by the country. And when then a private sector partner like Coca-Cola in that case comes in, um, it is a very different conversation to have. So it's not like a, a company wanting to support something and uh, funding some um, pilots or just very like uh, limited areas, but it's working with the Ministry of Health directly with other ministries too, um, like Ministry of Gender and for example, in, in some areas. Um, but then also working with the civil society, with uh, the communities um, that are all involved like in, in the response in the country. And the, the example that um, uh, is mentioned here is um, Project Last Mile, which was actually a collaboration, I mean, with, with a range of partners, including the Gates Foundation and USAID and others who, who, who like brought that together. And the very simple idea behind that, or like the, the um, the the fact is that uh, I mean you like for years you you could get like a cold Coca Cola bottle or some other kind of refreshment drink in any part of the country where it's been really difficult to get like medicines or vaccines that need like a cold um, structure um, a cold chain uh, structure at the same um, distribution so the question was can Coca Cola support like the ministry and other um, uh, players um, working on health product supply chains to improve that. And so this is, uh, I've, I have to look into the exact timelines, but we have more than 10 years that this partnership has been going on in uh, more than 10 countries as well, mostly like in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, it started in Tanzania and then spread to others. And it's really an example of like how private sector can bring in the capabilities. And it's about, I mean, developing the standards and like the structures. So it's not about like delivering actual health products, but but helping to, to build the capacities and, and the structures there. And we've seen huge improvements in terms of product availability, availability through that. And it's just one example how we can think out of the box to like to, to build these um, unusual partnerships as well. And um, I think it's it's literally it's it's also what is needed as we as we go forward. I guess the other part of that question is about sort of how what is the longevity of that kind of a thing? How sustainable are they? Because they get started because there are these partners come together with this idea and and they and they take off. And and how much do they live on? Sort of I guess. And how long do they live? And I, and I guess just the fact that you're saying this been ten years uh, going on it means that it has uh, lived on for uh, um, for some time, for quite some time. True. Okay. And a, a, one brief point to that, I mean, it's super important, not only to take partnerships like that to scale, but exactly as you say, um, to sustain them in terms of financing. And that means like, I mean, we're, we're all talking about partnership, but that's where we see this partnership in action again. So you have governments like not only building the capacities, but also then co-investing, taking up financing in part for some of the structures as well, taking over commitments. And I mean, in, in part of like how, how we work like through the global funds um, financial support is, is as well that you, um, well, it's always like bound to co-financing from countries. Um, they like whole, I mean, agreements and, and, and policies in place around that. But we're also working very, very closely with countries to increase like the domestic financing capacity in that sense and to to build those sustainable structures and i mean this is like the the direction we have to go i mean be it now for covid or for for other diseases and public health issues because it's a, a shared commitment and we can be like a, a mediator and also a transitional partner in that bringing in other partners who can help countries in that journey but in the end i mean what we want to build when we speak about building back better, we want to build the structures and the tools and the capacities and the solutions that are there to stay. Steve, question for you coming in is, um, I guess it's sort of like, how well are we doing with respect to building digital platforms from an integrated perspective and not from sort of like disease focused or you know program focused 
um, um, uh, perspective for each each one. I, is that the way that things are going? Are we doing a good job of sort of trying to think of platforms as being more integrated and not like maternal health, infectious disease, TB, COVID, um, sort of building those platforms and then hoping that they'll somehow sort of um, talk to each other. And I think the other question I'm going to throw in from my end along with that is, is what, you know, as India is sort of thinking about its national, you know, digital health mission, et cetera, what's your guidance to the regulators and to the policymakers? You know, what kind of framework should we be developing? I know that there's a lot of anxiety about the opportunity being smothered by overregulation in an uncharted field as well. So two questions really for you um, about sort of silos versus a platform cross-cutting and then the regulatory advice. Yeah, I think we're, the to the first question, I think we're still, it's a work in progress. That, that, that we are still seeing too many vertical apps. I mean, some health ministries have actually said, I'm done with the pilots, uh, you know, until you can get me a more fully integrated approach with more sustainable long term, uh, you know, validation, I'm not gonna, it's it's actually a liability to introduce this to tool to my country, without it being more, um, you know, cross cutting. So I think we now are seeing the pressure points to do that, even what was being described in India with the health ID with the the ID really is part of the sort of how to break that down tactically. But we're still not seeing enough sort of platform thinking. It's still kind of apps that would need to get um, the rolled up. And that's where this sort of question of interoperability becomes so critical. So then the various verticals can at least um, talk to each other. I think the other question, which um, is um, is a really important one because I think in some ways I would argue and I've argued this in the Stanford business school context, which is not a place you want to be a pro regulator. Um, but I've I've you know very much argued that the um, the lack of this sort of institutional framework, good governance, good policy, good regulatory policies actually thwarted innovation during COVID from getting to the places that it needed to get. That, in fact, a lot of innovators were quite frustrated. Some of the companies that we were just talking about, you know, were quite frustrated that they could, they put a lot of energy and they didn't see the real value proposition. They didn't see the impact. They thought they were, they, they, and, and part of it is they felt like they were throwing a lot of capability into a system that wasn't functional. And and so um, I think we do need to uh, to to create um, more uh, mechanisms. Um, I, I'm an advocate to say it doesn't need to be what we don't want to do is start having heavy layers of regulation on digital capabilities. It's to be very, very hard to do the dynamic uh, models, the sort of the uh, flexible tools. We don't want to have this sort of heavy duty kind of uh, regulatory model that we use with vaccines, say you know which uh, and 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 but we probably do need some vetting and and capability so if if nothing else to make it a more efficient transfer from the innovator to the health system and so you know there is a lot of talk about you know what are the sort of uh, right level and altitude of standards what are the right level and altitude of um you know kind of vetting mechanisms so a country i mean we had a lot of national ministries of health you know, literally going on Twitter to figure out which tracking tool or tracing tool they should be using in their country versus having, no, these are sort of four or five really good ones. Here's how to, you know, here's what we know about them. Here's the evidence. Here's, so we do need to provide that interface. I think we're doing some of that. We built a clearinghouse during COVID that has sustainable legs now for moving that forward, but we're going to have to do more um, to, to, to match those two um, areas of need. Um, final Sorry, go ahead. Uh, uh, Steve, to your um, to your uh, point about uh, governments sort of becoming tired of you know vertical kind of uh, things, I think the key is also the responsibility is also contingent on government providing database. So we at BBC Media Action have been talking about creating a D2C, a direct to consumer platform, a digital platform, which is calendarized, you know, where um, a, a person, a 
a person in a family is receiving health communication on other types of communication throughout the year. But for that, you need access to database and you need access to data that is co-shared, right? Now, in the absence of that, there is no point in building a platform. We have the, we have the grammar ready. We know how to do it, but the stumbling block is um, is is uh, lack of access. So, uh, like I said, you know, it has to really always be a mostly be a three way partnership. There is civil society and innovators like us um, who are working across platforms, including digital. Uh, we've done a lot of significant digital work in India. We have to look at the government providing that sort of backbone support and private sector innovators coming into, you know, uh, and talking about partnerships where we know that, for example, in India, the government will not pour in any more money to disseminate, uh, you know, campaigns on platforms. So how can we get into private sector partnerships as we have very successfully done, um, say on urban sanitation, on fecal sludge management? These are lessons that need to be duplicated and replicated. You know, uh, we did a partnership with Viacom 18 and we communicated on fecal sludge management, which is a very invisible topic. So what I'm saying is that we need to learn from other sectors and other experiences and put the learnings to use as well as in order to rethink and to use the pandemic as a portal, I think we need to redefine some of the problems that we are trying to address. Because if we think of the problem in the same old manner, then I don't think we'll be able to find uh, you know, a solution to the problem. Uh, and, and in this context, I also want to say that the pandemic has shown the deepest link between health systems and economic opportunities. We know the havoc. So you know, we need to think about lots of these other areas when we, when, when we prepare ourselves for the years to come into this new world, because yes, we all know that when we come out on the other side, whenever that it will be, it's going to be a different world. I don't know about a new world or an old world. It's certainly going to be different. So we need to rethink. And that is very, very key. And we need to reframe. The framing has to change because we have been looking at problems and solutions through the same frames. And I have a I have a colleague who's passionately introduced all of us and uh, you know about frames of Judith Butler. I think we need to look at all that as well to see how we can reframe problems and then you know the reframing of solutions can happen if we think innovatively, disruptively, and strategically enough. I think those are some general yeah, yeah. things that we need to bear in mind. I know we're about out of time, but and we mentioned a number of key themes. You know, trust. Uh, intersectionality, uh, you know, kind of digital readiness, etc. I, I would say multi-sector is the word that I would push. Yeah. Um, I feel like we yeah. keep talking yeah. about private sector versus government and what we have to do is come together and not forget the social sector, the role of philanthropy and the NGO and civil society yeah. and academic community. We have seen evidence over and over, this is part of my curriculum at Stanford, is that without that social sector engagement, many public private partners don't work. So mm -hmm. you've got to have you've got to have all three sectors. Yeah. Absolutely. It's about collective action. Yes. Yeah. So at the beginning, I said that when they invited me to moderate this, this was going to be the easiest job. So you guys have just given all the concluding remarks that we need to give. This is really, it's such a fantastic set of comments to hear from, from everyone. Um, I don't even need to try and conclude over here um, at this point. It's been a wonderful session and, and, and I couldn't agree more with, uh, you know, the need to sort of reframe and think about, you know, how what, how are we looking at the world at these challenges? Or thinking about, you know, what who are the partners? Who's playing what? And I think that has really that has changed. I mean, I, I think it's some, one of the things that I actually see as bright spots from this is that you know our reimagining of what is the role of civil society, what is the role of individuals to take on some of the world's biggest problems. I think in India and in the darkest moments of our lives, you know, uh, in in the last six months, right. It was individuals who came together and saved uh, more than anything else. And it was a role of individuals as being, you know, civic members um, who, who had this really important uh, sort of power in their hands. And I think that those are wonderful things that we're learning. And again, I think one of the other things is we talk again about equity and issues around gender. And I think the question about how do we balance 
the urgency of, you know, of COVID, but also making sure that we're not leaving sort of, you know, sight of those issues that could be considered as soft, right? Could be considered as sort of extraneous, but they're actually very much at the heart of what we're trying to deal with. Uh, they're actually very much central to, um, you know, to to having to solving the the, the problem. It's not it, there, there is no point in having you know this amazing science and solutions and health systems if we're not able to deal with the issues of equity and who's getting left out and left behind as well. Um, thank you so much. We've had wonderful discussions, um, and um, uh, I'm going to hand over back to Sagar and the Sun Cult team. Thank you so much, um, Bianca, Radharani, Steve. It was wonderful talking to you all and having this panel. Thank you, Anand. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Anand, and the entire panel. Uh, I think in a lot of classical music concerts, uh, there's no one speaks after the artists are done. So I'm also not going to speak a lot because it's been really, really phenomenal. Uh, we really enjoyed the discussion thoroughly, and I hope you all have to. Uh, thank you very much on behalf of the entire IntelliCap and Sankar team. I know all of you are extremely busy. Uh, you're in different time zones. Uh, Steve, I know, is struggling with his voice now with all his meetings across the day. Uh, but really, thanks a lot for uh, taking the time out, uh, really preparing well, uh, giving us some phenomenal insights from the from all your experiences and your work that you've done. Uh, we'll definitely look forward to welcome you again uh, on some other forum at Sankal, maybe having a version two of this some months down the line. But thank you very much. And uh, really, really, it's, it's really great. Uh, thank you, everyone, including the audience as well, for your very insightful questions. Uh, it really kept the discussion very lively and I guess challenged our panelists to some extent as well. So yes, it's, it's, it could not have been a success without you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.